<clears throat> Welcome everyone uh, to our Zoom room of the Center for Jewish Studies at Stanford University. Uh, and I am the faculty director, Charlotte von Robert, um, and also scholar of Talmud in the, in the Department of Religious Studies. My connection to the tip, topic is um, that I did attend at some point uh, a YIVO summer course. So I have a little bit of Yiddish in my background, but you hear the German um, accent. Um, and my function here today, uh, this afternoon, is to introduce the introducer. Um, but before I do that, I wanted to um, say a couple thank yous. Um, uh, for this series. Um, um, Gabriella will speak about the sponsor, uh, but uh, I wanted to say a thank you to Berkeley, to uh, University, Jew the Center for Jewish Studies, the Jewish Studies Program at the University of California, Berkeley for co-sponsoring our Clara Sumpf um, Yiddish lecture, lecture series. Um, lecture in Yiddish literature series this year. And I also want to thank especially Shana Hammerman, our still newish, but almost now uh, veteran um, associate director um, of our Center for Jewish Studies here. She's in the background, but she makes all this possible. I want to thank uh, Zachary Baker and Adrian Smith and Etan Kensky, our local Yiddishists, um, who you will meet tomorrow also uh, for helping us keeping the Yiddish Lane Kais going uh, during the year, and, and in particular in this, this uh, Zoom year. And last not, but not least, I want to thank um, my colleague, uh, Gabriela. Um, uh, but before I do that, I want to remind everyone, um, as I'm reminded by my trusted associate director, that at the end of this, this is a technicality, at the end of uh, our speaker, Cecile will speak to us for, uh, um, for 40 minutes or so, and then it, uh, the question and answers in the end will, if you can post your questions, comments in Q&A, that way you can all participate. Um, but now just a very, very brief intro for Gabriela, uh, my dear friend, colleague, uh, Gabriela Safran, who is the Eva Chernov Loki Professor in Jewish Studies and Slavic Language and Literature. She has many administrative functions at Stanford, and she will be our future Associate Dean for the Humanities. Um, so we're very happy that Gabriela took the time also uh, to join us and um, introduce our speaker. I will not go through the long list of publications of Gabriela um, because, <laughs> because Gabriela will introduce our speaker for today. And Cecile, welcome back to Stanford. I pass it on to you, Gabriela. So um, hello, everybody. Welcome. I am. Um, I'm so uh, honored to uh, to welcome you to this uh, this iteration of our Clara Sumpf lecture series. Um, this is a series that was named after Clara Sumpf. Um, I was lucky enough when I arrived at Stanford 22 years ago to have Clara Sumpf sit in on my class uh, Beyond Fiddler on the Roof, uh, Eastern European. In Jewish literature and film, she was a um, a wonderful, um, very incredibly smart, very opinionated woman in her eighties. Um, as I recall, very small. Um, she kind of sat sort of in the back, and at first didn't uh, sort of held on and like didn't offer opinions, and then more and more did offer opinions throughout the course of the quarter, and the students became totally fascinated by her and everything that she had to say, um, and just her kind of take on Yiddish literature and, and the Jewish culture, not only of um, the 
sort of growing up in New York in the 30s, 20s, 30s, 40s, but also her memories of what her parents had gone through coming from Russia, from the Russian Empire. Um, she she kind of, I think, made the whole everything that we were studying kind of come alive, not only for the students, but for me as well. Um, so and she had unbelievably beautiful Yiddish. Um, so so it was really it's really a, a kind of lovely thing that we have this lecture series. Uh, it is distinctive in that we ask our lecturers to give a talk in English and then a talk the next day in Yiddish. Um, and this is um, technically very hard for the lecturers. <laughs> um, and they've they've dealt with it in various ways. But it's really in the spirit of uh, Clara Sumpf, who I think didn't compromise um, that we would that we would make these uh, difficult technical demands of our um, of our speakers. Um, so our speaker today is Cecile Kuznets, who is Associate Professor of Jewish History at Bard College. Um, I have known, I think I met Cecile around the same time that I met Clara Sumpf, my first quarter at Stanford, because she was a Stanford um, PhD in PhD student at the time in the history department. So it's really a great thing to welcome her back. I just wish we could welcome you back physically, geographically, in three dimensions, in person. Sadly, we are welcoming only your avatar, um, your, your two-dimensional avatar, but someday you have to come back uh, so we can go out to dinner. But um, but yes, yeah, so Cecile was a, a graduate student here. Um, and someone who sort of, to my mind, was this sort of unbelievable example of um, knowledgeableness, um, also incredible Yiddish, um, and, and just the sort of command of the um, both Eastern European and American uh, sort of uh, history of Ashkenazic Jews, uh, someone who's really uh, in a way that I sort of have appreciated more and more, uh, able to work across that geographical divide. So many people are on one side or the other. It's a lot of work and reading and languages to be on both sides um, of the of the Atlantic. Um, this this emerged in Cecile's dissertation, which then became her first book, uh, Yivo and the Making of Modern Jewish Culture. So about the the institution of Yivo in its first uh, iteration in uh, in Vilna and then in New York. Um, now uh, Cecile is continuing to think about the complexities of Jewish space, Jews in space, not like Jews in space, like way out there with their space lasers, but um, but Jews sort of occupying physical space. Um, so she's writing a second book about Jewish architecture and urban space in Eastern Europe. Um, and it's coming out of that um, coming out of that project that she will speak to us today. Um, oh, I just got a little message from Shana. Let me just say, um, I want to remind you, I'll remind you again at the end of this, but let me remind you before we turn this over to Cecile that there is this other lecture tomorrow that Cecile will heroically deliver in Yiddish. Uh, it will be at noon. And um, Shana will send out the link to tomorrow's lecture following today's lecture. So keep it in mind, keep it in your, in your calendar. It's at noon Pacific time tomorrow. All right, so now uh, we turn this over to Cecile, whose talk today is entitled Building Yiddish Culture, Doikait and Jewish Architecture. Welcome, Cecile. Well, thank you so much, Gabriella, for that really lovely introduction. And thanks as well to Charlotta uh, for the previous introduction and to everyone at Stanford Jewish Studies for the invitation to be with you. And of course, to Shana Hammerman for all of her work organizing uh, these lectures. Uh, it, it really is a very special honor for me to be presenting the Clara Sumpf lectures because uh, not only because I'm a Stanford graduate, as Gabriella mentioned, but also because I also knew uh, Clara Sumpf. And as, as a graduate student, I was a member of the Yiddish Laying Cries, uh, of which she was the member and which later endowed the, this lecture series in her memory. So it's really a wonderful honor for me. Uh, and I only regret, of course, that I can't be with you in person. So in lieu of that, I, I, I brought my Stanford Stanford Hillel mug here. 
uh, to uh, so I at least have this this palm tree at least to uh, remind me of the palm trees of Palo Alto. So. <clears throat> Okay, so, um, so uh, let me begin by posing a question. Can buildings look Jewish? This question was once posed to me with a degree of skepticism when I told a professor that I wished to study the intersection of architecture and Jewish history. On a related note, an article that I published sev several years ago asked the question, is there such a thing as Yiddish architecture? Now, I'm not promising to answer these questions definitively tonight, but I do hope to show that a close consideration of architecture and the built environment can enrich the study of Jewish and in particular Yiddish culture. <clears throat> so in recent years, the so-called spatial turn in the humanities has also impacted the field of Jewish studies. But I would say that most of this work has considered Jewish space as a rather abstract concept or is focused on the representation of various buildings and spaces in written texts and how they've been remembered in historical memory. So I would argue that despite this growing body of work, there's still much that remains to be done to actually examine specific concrete buildings and landscapes that were constructed by and for Jewish clients and residents and users. Now, whether or not such structures and spaces look Jewish, they still remain important evidence of how Jews shaped, in particular, the cities in which they lived, worked, and interacted with their neighbors. Now, the story of Jews' residence in cities and the impact of their presence in cities and activities on the urban landscape is, of course, tied to a larger story of urbanization in the 19th century as industrialization led to new economic opportunities in cities and easier transportation to reach them. And Jews who had historically been urban dwellers, disproportionately urbanized, also flocked to larger metropolitan centers along with their Christian neighbors in the course of the 19th century. As these cities expanded and new construction take place to accommodate their growth, most of this growth was on the outskirts where there was more open space available for building. And these locations had an additional advantage that they often possessed open space and greenery, which created a healthful environment and also helped reinforce the contra contrast between these newer areas of the city and the crowded, often dilapidated neighborhoods in the urban core. So most, when we think of where Jews lived in, let's say, you know, the great cities of, of Europe, we think of traditional Jewish quarters in the heart of the medieval city, which today might be a picturesque tourist site, but by, but by the 19th century and the 20th century were often very poor neighborhoods, dilapidated, crowded, and unhygienic. So the newer areas on the outskirts of the city presented a clear contrast. Now in Eastern Europe, if such building was spurred by urbanization in the 19th century, it continued and even intensified in the 20th century, particularly with the rebuilding that took place after the widespread destruction of the First World War. Moreover, such building, particularly by Jewish individuals and organizations continued even up until the late 1930s, even as the economy in Poland worsened and anti-Semitism intensified. So one of the things I'd like to argue this evening is that the decision of, of Jews to continue to invest large sums of money and a great deal of effort to construct highly visible and after all immovable buildings in these cities could be seen as an expression of doakite. So doakite or hereness is a principle that's usually linked to diaspora nationalism to express the idea of Jews belonging and rootedness in the countries of their residence in the diaspora. And it's often contrasted to Zionism, which aspired to create a new Jewish homeland in a new location. But I'd like to argue that this concept of doakite or hereness can be used more broadly, not only in the context of diaspora nationalism, but can be read into a variety of structures 
So not only it's something that's not only present in written text, but also in the built environment. Now the growth of urban centers, of course, coincided in the modern period with the development of modern Jewish cultural and political movements. So it should be no surprise that these movements also helped shape the cities in which Jews resided. And of course, among these movements were closely intertwined diaspora nationalism and Yiddishism. But there are some difficulties that we should keep in mind if we set out to ex explore specifically the impact of Yiddish on the urban landscape. When Zionists emigrated to Palestine, they had an unusual opportunity. In many cases, they were literally constructing a new society, literally building the buildings and the streets from scratch. So if in Tel Aviv, Jews designed what's sometimes referred to as the first Hebrew city, Jews in the diaspora rarely had the chance to have such a, a large scale and direct impact on the environments in which they lived. <clears throat> Another factor to consider is that real estate and construction are expensive. And so most of the Jewish organizations or individuals in the diaspora context who could commission purpose-built structures were relatively affluent. Yiddish speakers and supporters of Yiddish culture were underrepresented in the middle and upper class in Eastern Europe, and they had fewer resources to undertake such expensive projects. So it stands to reason that they had fewer opportunities to leave their imprint in a significant way on the environments that they inhabited. Nevertheless, they also created a variety of spaces to house innovative cultural functions and to respond to new communal needs. As I've already alluded to, these were often construction projects that took place in newer parts of the city on the outskirts. And they were away, a distance away from the historic Jewish quarters that we often think of today as the focal points of Jewish life and which today are also the focal points of post-Holocaust memory if we think of the East European experience. And I would, I would venture to say that this is one of the reasons that these types of Jewish buildings have tended to be overlooked. A second reason that I think they've been overlooked is that overwhelmingly they were erected for secular purposes. The field of Jewish architecture such as exists has been dominated overwhelmingly by a focus on synagogues. So for example, the English language journal of Polish Jewish studies, Pauline has an index. And if you look in the index under architecture, it will say architecture see synagogues. Now, of course, Synagogues are very notable buildings. They're very important buildings. In many cases, they are aesthetically very important. So uh, this focus on their on, on synagogue architecture is of course well deserved. But I would but I would say that perhaps this focus has led to uh, less attention to the broad range of structures that Jews erected, diverse both in their function and in their design. And that only by considering this broader range can we fully appreciate the building of Yiddish culture. Now, before we turn to some examples, there's one more theoretical question that I'd like to address. How can a field like Yiddish studies, which after all is defined by something intangible, that is to say language, how can it be put into dialogue with the study of architecture which after all deals with concrete buildings and landscapes. So today I'd like to suggest three approaches to this question. So at this point, I think I'll just pause to, to, share, my, to share my PowerPoint. Okay, I'll, I'll trust that everyone can see that and someone will let me know if there's any problem. Okay. So, so I'd like to suggest, broadly speaking, three approaches to this question of how Yiddish studies can be put into dialogue with the study of architecture and the built environment. The first is to, 
The first is to consider explicitly uses of the Yiddish language, both written and oral. So in an article that I wrote back when I was a graduate student at Stanford, I discussed how Jewish communal leaders in interwar Vilna encouraged merchants to include Yiddish writing on their shop signs along with Polish writing. And they saw this as a way of asserting Jews rightful place in the city and also as a symbol of Jewish national pride. And it seems that Polish authorities also saw this as a, an assertive move of Jews to assert their place in Vilna's landscape because they were known to harass Jewish merchants who did feature Yiddish on their shop signs. In addition, informally, many streets were known by distinctive Yiddish names that differed from the official names. And in fact, many non-Jewish residents used these names as well because since, since Vilna changed hands many times and different authorities would come in and change the street names, often the colloquial Yiddish names were the most common and easiest to recognize for all residents of the city. Now, of course, another factor to consider is that throughout Jewish communities in Eastern Europe, as well as around the world, wherever, wherever Jewish immigrants had settled, Yiddish would commonly be heard spoken in the streets and spaces of the neighborhood. So another approach to considering what we might call Yiddish space would be to think of the oral soundscape, uh, how, how Yiddish language was used orally to create a distinct environment. And I know that Gabriella has done some work in the field of sound study. So perhaps she or one of her students could follow up on this angle at some point. Now, a second approach that I'd like to suggest would be to look for a distinctive style of what we might call Yiddish architecture. Now, many scholars have documented how Yiddish writers and artists sought to produce a modern culture that combined elements of tradition, in particularly, particularly folklore, with elements of the European avant-garde. And there are many, many examples, of course, in Yiddish literature, theater, and to a lesser extent, the visual arts. Now, in the late 19th century, many European nationalist movements also sought to forge a distinct national style in architecture. A little later, after the First World War, some turned to a modernist aesthetic rooted in the German Bauhaus that they saw as transcending national boundaries, hence the term the international style. So these debates between a distinct national style and a kind of supranational modernist style played out among many different national groups and also in the case of the Yishuv, where the Zionist movement had the opportunity to build on a wide scale and debated what would be the most appropriate forms for this to take. For example, the Byzantine style with its Middle Eastern connotations versus the Bauhaus aesthetic that became dominant in sections of Tel Aviv. However, so far from my research, it seems that there was little parallel discussion of the secular architectural forms that Jewish architecture in the diaspora should take. There are some fascinating uh, exceptions to this. And of course, the large exception is synagogue architecture where there are many, many iterations of debates over the proper style. But again, my focus here more is on secular buildings for secular purposes. So even though I haven't found that there's been, there was really a robust theoretical debate about these questions, I would still argue that paying close attention to issues of style and citing can yield fresh insights into the history of Yiddish culture. So a case in point that will be my first example is an ambitious construction project that was launched in the city of Lublin, Poland by supporters of the Yiddish secular school movement. <clears throat> Now, I'm sure many of you know that in interwar Eastern Europe, a whole network of Yiddish secular schools developed that provided a modern education in the Yiddish language for the first time to their pupils. In 1937, Polish government authorities closed one such institution, the left-leaning Peretz Volkschule, 
The official reason given was its poor physical condition, which from this photo seems to be quite a genuine concern. However, school leaders also suspected that the socialist spirit of the school, as they called it, also played a role in the crackdown by government authorities. Educational activists in Lublin, mostly adherents of the Socialist Bund or the liberal Volkspartei, both diaspora nationalist parties, vowed that they would replace this decrepit rental premises with a modern building. The new facility that they planned was called the Peretz Volkshuis, and it was designed to accommodate seven school grades along with a daycare center, a kindergarten, a library, as well as meeting rooms for theater, sports, orchestra, and choir activities. The building site was in one of these newer neighborhoods that I've described, a short distance from the medieval city center along Lubitowska Street, which you can see as the, the broad street on the left of the map uh, leading, um, leading north away from the city center. This, this street developed as a main commercial thoroughfare a short distance from the city, center of the city and a number of modern Jewish institutions located there, beginning with the Jewish hospital, number six on the map, uh, which was built in 1886. And even in the uh, 20th century was surrounded by gardens that provided open space and a healthful environment. Now, as you can see on this map with number five, uh, nearby was the famous Yeshiva Shachmei Lublin, an imposing building that opened in 1930. The Folkshoi's proximity to this very well-known Yeshiva created a striking contrast that did, that did not go unnoticed by observers. So secular school leaders remarked, quote, that in two different fields, the two houses wish to spread Torah and knowledge, end quote. Another group of Yiddish school activists less generously expressed the hope that the Volkshoys would become a center of secular Yiddish culture, quote, in opposition to a second building in Lublin, which has become the symbol of reaction on the Jewish street. So however different the ideological underpinnings of these two institutions, the Folkhoys and the yeshiva, we can see that both enjoyed a modern and healthful setting amid greenery that was a clear contrast to conditions in the medieval Jewish quarter with its overcrowding and time-worn buildings. Observers praised the up-to-date fixtures of the Folkshoys and contrasted them to the dilapidated rental premises that the school had formerly occupied. In addition, the building's exterior presented striking evidence of its founder's orientation to the future. The design by Henrik Becker is starkly modern and eschews any decorative touches, nor does it signal in any way that it houses a Jewish institution. Rather, it presents a powerful image of a progressive institution that was in tune with the latest trends in European culture. In this, it also presented a clear contrast to its neighbor, the yeshiva, which featured classical elements in its design. And moreover, the yeshiva building was literally legible as a Jewish institution. It's kind of hard to make out here on this uh, old photo, but the name of the uh, yeshiva was inscribed in both Hebrew and Roman letters. And above the columns, there's a verse from uh, Psalms written in, in, in the Hebrew, the original Hebrew script. So the contrast between the Folkshoys and the yeshiva in terms of their purpose and their ideological orientation was reinforced by the very different visual presentation of these two institutions. Now, of course, we shouldn't forget that the Yeshiva's Chachmei Lublin was in its own right a very innovative institution, but its ultimate goal was to reinvigorate traditional Jewish learning. The Folkshoys, on the other hand, seemed to look elsewhere for its inspiration. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> its name echoes the so-called people's houses that were created in Russia and elsewhere in Europe to provide space 
for a variety of cultural and educational activities aimed at the working class. So we might read the choice of these Yiddishists in Lublin, both of their name for their new institution and the style of their building as a way to situate themselves as part of the European left. And I should mention that the Brahma Grodzka Center in Lublin, which does wonderful work, recently had an exhibit on the Volkshoys, and they have a, a great deal of material available on their website if anyone is interested in learning more about this building and its history. It, even in the post-war period, is quite fascinating, although I'm not going into that today. <clears throat> So now I'd like to turn to a building that I've written about and spoken about extensively over the years, and that's the headquarters of Vivo, which, as I'm sure most of you know, was founded in 1925 as the first center for Yiddish scholarship. In 1928, Yivo's building committee in Vilna purchased a plot of land with two existing wooden structures, and it set about renovating the larger of these two structures to serve as the Institute's headquarters. The site of the building is indicated in this map by the brown rectangle with the large blue arrow pointing to it. Uh, this, was, this site was situated in the neighborhood of Polyanka, which was west of the historic Jewish quarter, which is the triangular area at the center of the map. And as was the case in Lublin, this newer neighborhood had only recently been developed and it featured open fields and broad straight streets. And this presented, again, a clear contrast to the traditional Jewish quarter of Vilna, uh, particularly by the interwar period when it was known as a center of poverty and overcrowding. When the YIVO finished renovating its premises and opened it in 1933, Observers stressed its modern amenities, just as they had in, had in the case of the Volkshoys. But the YIVO building was not uh, purpose built to serve as the headquarters of the Institute. And the, per the building that it purchased really didn't boast any particularly distinctive architectural style. Nevertheless, I would still argue that the Institute used visual language to convey its commitment to a Yiddish culture that was thoroughly modern. It commissioned a series of photographs of its headquarters by Moshe Vorobechik. Moshe Vorobechik was a native of Vilna who, is, who studied at the Bauhaus and went on to achieve fame for his photographs of Paris published under the name Moy Ver. Uh, he later emigrated to Israel and did further work uh, under the name Moshe Raviv. His, by the way, his work was also the subject of a recent exhibit uh, at the uh, National, Lithuanian National Museum in Vilnius, uh, but uh, unfortunately there's not much available online from that exhibit, although a, a very nice um, book was published uh, of his work. So here we can see that Vorobechik used the technique of photo collage. This is actually two photos superimposed on each other. And this is just one example of a series of images that he made of the YIVO headquarters, where I would argue that he transforms this rather nondescript building into a kind of modernist icon, something befitting an institution that Lucy Davidovich famously described as an institution that belonged to the future. Now, while I hope that these examples demonstrate the importance of considering style and citing, I would still argue that such factors alone cannot fully capture the imprint of Yiddish culture on the urban landscape. So I'll now turn to a third approach. I'd like to suggest that we, we should consider not only physical forms of these buildings, but the kinds of activities that took place within them. And this will allow us to broaden our purview from structures with an explicitly Yiddishist purpose or a distinctive architectural style to include the vernacular. And here, when I use the term vernacular, I have in mind both its application to architecture and to spatial practices. In other words, buildings that were both um, not particularly distinctive as uh, in aesthetic terms, but reflected popular design trends and also everyday uses of space. 
So it's in this spirit that I'll turn to my last two examples, <clears throat> both of which come from residential architecture. For the moment, we'll remain in Vilna, although we'll be moving to the other side of town, as you'll see in a second. In Vilna in 1898, a set of apartment blocks was um, initiated with the goal of providing, as supporters put it, quote, a home and a roof for many poor and orphans. So this, this project was inspired by the work of the Jewish banker and philanthropist Hippolyte Wawelberg, who earlier in Warsaw had funded a project to provide affordable housing to working class residents of the Polish capital. As he put it, his aim was to raise the health, cultural and ethical level of the broad working masses of the capital. Here we see a plan of the first uh, housing project erected by, um, by Wawelberg's foundation and some contemporary photographs of some of the buildings. Now, Wawelberg's initiative in Warsaw inspired the Jewish Colonization, Colonization Association in which he was active to undertake a similar project in Vilna. The Jewish Colonization Association or the JCA was a, was a philanthropic organization that aided Russian Jews primarily through supporting their emigration, but also increasingly turned to work within the Russian empire. So the JCA purchased a plot of land on the outskirts of Vilna, in this case on the southeastern outskirts among open fields. And you can see on the map on the left that uh, the site is indicated by the black arrow and on the right in the close up by the white arrow. And in both cases, the, the actual footprint of the two buildings can be seen in red. So, it, so on this plot of land, it erected two apartment blocks. The headquarters of the JCA criticized the initial design seen here by the architect Edward Goldberg, who had also, uh, uh, also designed the Warsaw buildings. They felt that this design was too elaborate for workers' housing. However, Goldberg managed to sneak in some nice decorative touches in the two <clears throat> brick buildings that he did erect in his revised design. <clears throat> so here one may say that the stylistic choices were shaped by class. In this case, the, JCA, the JCA's wealthy leadership and the style that they felt was appropriate for the, the, for, for the Jewish working class. Nothing too fancy. <clears throat> Excuse me. When the buildings opened in 1900, they contained just about 200 apartments that consisted of one room each with shared kitchen and toilet facilities. In addition, the complex provided a whole range of amenities, including a daycare center, a bathhouse, and a laundry, and something that might seem particularly relevant to us even today as we come out of the pandemic, it also included isolation rooms specifically for residents who contracted infectious diseases. In 1903, a doctor was hired to manage the buildings and provide medical care at a free on-site clinic. The following year, an elementary school opened on the premises with about 90 students, both boys and girls, that was supported by the OPA, the Society for the Promotion of Culture Among the Jews of Russia. <clears throat> at the time of the 1905 revolution, tenants of the so-called cheap houses in Vilna demanded both a 25% rent reduction and the construction of a synagogue on the premises. So we can see that these, these buildings became a community in their own right. They housed a microcosm of larger Jewish society, which included everyone from political radicals to Orthodox Jews. <clears throat> Excuse me. <coughs> We have a, a kind of rare peak, uh, albeit a fictional peak, at life within one of these working class apartments in the fiction of Chaim Grada, who in his novel, The Aguna, uh, describes a family that lives in one of these apartments in the cheap houses. This is a family with two daughters 
And he describes how they attempt to divide up this small space to create a semblance of privacy. He writes that the, their apartment consisted of, quote, one large room with a kitchen. A third of the room was partitioned off by an old wardrobe with bits of cloth hanging from either side up to the walls. At night, that was the bedroom for the whole family. In the evenings, when the curtains were drawn, there in the darkness was the girls' room. The sisters used to alternate. One evening, the older one sat there with a boy, and the next evening, the younger one. So while one or another of the daughters in the family was sitting behind this curtain in search of some privacy, the family members on the other side of the curtain would discuss the couple's romantic prospects as they listened to the sounds coming from the other side of this room divider. So of course, these apartments did not provide a great deal of privacy. Now, in what sense were these cheap houses a kind of Yiddish architecture or Yiddish space? Certainly, Yiddish was the lingua franca that was spoken among their working class Jewish inhabitants, such as Grada's characters. And in addition, we should note that they became the site for the production of Yiddish culture in, both, in ways that were both covert and overt. One early resident recalled an unexpected knock on the door, which frightened him. This was a visit by the building manager who was coming around with a group of visiting well-dressed women from St. Petersburg. And the manager wished to show this particular tenant's apartment to these visitors to show how tidy and respectable he was. However, this individual was quite frightened by this knock on the door because in reality, he was not a model tenant. He was running an illegal Bundes printing press in his apartment. He found this location in the cheap houses convenient after moving this illegal operation from se around several locations in Vilna. For one thing, he was on a high floor and because uh, this was one of the highest, if not the highest building in Vilna, there were no neighbors who could peek in his window on a high floor and, and notice what he was doing in his apartment. But he also wrote in his memoirs that there was quote, more than enough tumult to cover the noise of operating his printing press. So we can well imagine that the actual conduct of residents didn't always match reformers' ideals of this working class behavior, proper working class behavior that they expected of the residents. In 1922, a block of rooms was rented in the cheap houses by the Yiddish teacher seminary. The seminary trained instructors for the Yiddish secular schools and it attracted young people from all over the region. And many of them had no relatives or places to stay in the city. They needed a safe, safe and affordable housing while they were attending school. So the seminary rented a block of rooms to create a dormitory that housed between 50 and 100 students, depending on the year, that consisted of several sleeping rooms, as well as two bathrooms, a kitchen, and a large sitting room. Now for these, these idealistic students living in the dormitory, it became the subject of quote, endless stories and even legends. They managed the premises together jointly, making common decisions about budgeting and rotating tasks such as cooking and cleaning. And when they needed to restock heating material into their top floor uh, facilities, Everyone was required to show up and form a human chain in order to carry heavy baskets of coal or firewood up to, up to the top floor of the buildings. The seminary director wrote of quite the interesting, excuse me, quote, the interesting dormitory collective where students worked together, held lectures, glued paper bags together to earn some money, earned a bit, that is to say, went hungry together with gusto uh, they were cheerful, hoped for better things, and studied with truly exceptional zeal. Conditions for the students were very poor, but these students, the former residents, were called fondly, relaxing among the nearby hills, enjoying the views from their top floor windows, which we can see here in this photo on the right. On the other hand, they were called less fondly that since it was, they were several kilometers from the seminary premises in the city center, 
they would have to get up early and run, run to early morning classes the distance of about three kilometers. In 1927, the seminary began a fundraising campaign to modernize the dormitory. As in the other case studies I've discussed, it stressed the need for a healthy living environment with quote, proper fixtures, comforts, suitable furniture, enough heating and lighting. In their fundraising brochure, school activists appealed to quote, all friends of Yiddish culture everywhere to support the youth that comes to the seminary with the fervent desire to serve Yiddish culture, end quote. These dedicated young people, they argued, required secure living conditions in order to complete their training and go on to educate the next generation in the Yiddish secular schools. Thus, they described the dormitory in the cheap houses as central to the future of Yiddish culture as a whole. Now for my final example, I'd like to move briefly across the Atlantic Ocean to the Bronx, New York where in the 1920s, a number of cooperative housing projects were constructed by Jewish immigrants, largely Yiddish speakers from Eastern Europe. These residential complexes catered to a range of ideologies from the communist coupes to the socialist Zionist Farband houses to the labor oriented amalgamated houses to the Yiddishist Sholem Aleichem houses. Like the European examples that we've discussed, these projects were also at a distance from dense older neighborhoods in the city center where immigrants first settled upon their arrival, most famously the Lower East Side, which were of course overcrowded and, <clears throat> and uh, often unhygienic uh, and unsanitary. By contrast, these housing cooperatives were located in an area of the Bronx shown on this map that offered a green airy setting, roughly similar, we could say, to it, that enjoyed by residents of the Vilna cheap houses. You can see from the setting that this area is bordered on the north by Van Cortlandt Park and on the east by a reservoir. So it, it was unusually green, let's say, and surrounded by nature for an area within New York City. In addition, each complex itself featured large, carefully landscaped courtyards, which created both additional green space and an area for residents to congregate and enhance their sense of community. As the amalgamated management wrote, quote, gardens are an important part of our cooperative community. Now these cooperative housing projects in New York were modeled on socialist housing cooperatives that were erected in Europe and in the Europe, case of the European projects, they often featured modern designs that reflected the progressive politics of the groups that organized them. These American examples, however, eschewed both the modernist aesthetic that we saw in the Volkshois and the proletarian sensibility that we saw in the cheap houses. Instead, most employed the conservative Tudor revival style which was also common among single family homes in that part of the Bronx, or the Art Deco style that was then fashionable. So these design choices suggest that despite their leftist politics, residents of these complexes ultimately aspired to join the American middle class. Like the cheap houses, these complexes also formed communities of their own running all kinds of services and amenities, including shovel, shuttle buses, grocery stores, and canteens. Moreover, their inhabitants were self-selected to share similar ideological leanings. The most relevant to our theme tonight are the Sholem Aleichem houses, where residents were united by a shared commitment to Yiddish culture. And many, many leading figures of Yiddish culture were residents of the Sholem Aleichem houses, just to name a few, the writer Avram Raisin, the historian Yankov Shatsky, the poet Malka Lee, and the sculptor Aaron Godelman. Set on a secluded hilltop lot around the landscaped interior courtyard that you saw earlier, the design of the Sholem Aleichem houses by Springsteen and Goldhammer gives the impression a bit of a citadel a little bit separate from the surrounding American landscape. The complex of 15 buildings, which were completed in 1927, included 
over 200 apartments, as well as spaces for cultural activities such as art studios, a library, and an auditorium for concerts, plays, and readings. Like the dormitory of the teacher seminary, here activists created a setting where their engagement with Yiddish culture extended beyond, say, just the schoolroom or the theater, it went, it went on to permeate all aspects of their daily life. So to sum up, I hope I've shown how Yiddish impacted the built environment in a variety of ways. While not as imposing as the great synagogues of Europe or the Bauhaus landscapes of Tel Aviv, Yiddish speakers and activists also created structures that reflected their activities and values. They asserted their presence in the cities where they resided through the use of a distinct language, both written and oral. They constructed buildings whose design choices signaled their modernist sensibilities and class orientations, and whose siting bespoke their concern with the health of Jewish society, particularly Jewish youth. Finally, they imbued the spaces they inhabited with a sense of community, forming environments where Yiddish culture could flourish. Now, Jewish historians have long recognized that the modernization of Jewish society is linked both to urbanization and to the development of new cultural and political movements. Historians have recently written about the influence of the former on the latter. That is to say, they've argued that modern Jewish politics and culture cannot be understood apart from their urban context. Tonight, what I've tried to do is to emphasize the opposite, in other words, the influence of the latter on the former, arguing that movements such as Yiddishism and diaspora nationalism themselves shaped the urban environment. And lastly, I'd also like to argue that all of the examples I've discussed could be considered concrete expressions of doakai or hearness. Returning to this concept that's associated with diaspora nationalism, I think we see it expressed clearly in, in writings by the founders of the Peretz Folkhois in Lublin. These largely working class activists raised substantial sums in the late 1930s, even among rising poverty and anti-Semitism to create their building. They described it as a metaphor for their own rootedness in Polish soil. Quote, the Jewish masses in Lublin, digging the foundation of the great people's building deep in the ground, thereby gave an answer to those who intend to spread despair and doubt, an answer to fascism, an answer to anti-Semitism, end quote. So to understand the strength of such convictions and the legacy of Yiddishism and diaspora nationalism, I would argue that we must examine not only the text that these movements produce, but also how they set out to build literally Yiddish culture. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cecile. That was wonderful. Um, so our, um, our many participants have already begun to put questions into the chat or into the uh, Q&A spot, which is where they're supposed to put them. Um, and I will read one now, which is quite specific. Okay. okay. Um, what was the height of the ceilings? These buildings were five stories. I think this is about the Shom Aleichem house in, um, in the Bronx. Um, so these buildings were five stories. In New York City, the tenements were six stories because that was the height of the fire ladders. That was the height that the fire ladders could go. Also, what was the construction of the walls? Was it laths and plaster as against sheetrock today? The construction of these buildings is important. Wow. Okay, Cecile, take it away. Uh, well, that that is that it, th those are uh, sp very specific questions. Um, I uh, if 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 you're asking about the Shalom Aleichem houses, I'm afraid I really can't uh, I really can't answer those questions. Uh, I, I I know this isn't exactly to the point, but in the case of the cheap houses in Vilna, I do have a lot of very detailed construction information, and I know that 
uh, you know, reformers were very, uh, very much uh, concerned with calculating exactly the cube, the amount, the cubic, you know, um, volume of uh, of each apartment and how much air, you know, they would contain in order to to try to achieve this goal of decreasing density and, and achieving more healthful living conditions. So I know that these these kinds of questions were taken seriously, but I'm I but I'm afraid I don't have that that kind of data to uh, to answer this specific question. Okay, so I have a question that's actually for me, um, which is uh, Can you put kind it of back, Gabriella. I should. Did I'll you... put it in the chat and then I'll ask it. Okay. Um, so, so yeah. So my question kind of follows up on the. Um, the, the kind of suggestion that you gave, which is like, does this, is this a sound, is this a history about sound? And, and it made me think that people, uh, people write about the landscape of the kind of Jewish landscape of Eastern Europe, um, thinking about how non-Jews recognize Jewish spaces, right? So, um, Ala Sakalova um, has this uh, really great article about um how like travelers like 18th and 19th century travelers go through uh eastern european jewish villages and they kind of recognize the space as jewish in some way like they recognize the synagogues but they also recognize other things about the space which is like people's bodies or their talk or their food and and allah says it's kind of accurate even though some in some ways these people are really anti-Semitic and they have all these like weird superstitions about Jews, but they do recognize things that are actually there. Um, and she's talking not about these like Yiddish spaces, but about some other kinds of Eastern European Jewish spaces. Um, and Rutha Kohane has this book, the, um, the Music Libel Against the Jews, where she talks about the kind of sound of Jewish, of Jews to non-Jews and how non-Jews Christians would talk about the sound of Jewish prayer coming out of the synagogue as being really disturbing and maybe animal-like. Uh, but that's also kind of a moment of like, it's recognized from the outside. So what I really wonder is like these buildings that you've described so kind of fascinatingly, are they ever recognized as Jewish by anyone who isn't Jewish? Or are they only recognized as Jewish by fellow Jews? Or not even that? Um. Yes, I mean that's um, you know that's an important question, and I think there's a you know there's a lot of there's several different ways to approach it, but I think you know the short answer I think is yes, uh, and um, I, mean, I think in part you know there, there's different ways to approach it, right? Because in some cases somebody walking by might not recognize you know if someone a non-Jew walking by wouldn't be able to tell from the facade of the building, right? Let's say that it houses a Jewish function, but they might. If they saw people, you know, coming in or out of the building, they might recognize those people as Jewish. Or if they heard Yiddish spoken, they would recognize it. But I think, you know, that of course the flip side of arguing that this was that these building projects were a significant way for Jews to kind of make their presence felt is that there was there were pushback from from people who didn't want Jews to assert their presence. So so there were there are in some cases. Um, you know, I think articles in the in the non-Jewish press, you know, kind of complaining about Jewish construction projects being in too prominent a location, for example, in Lublin. Um, uh, also, you know, another um, another way to think of this question, although it, it wasn't something I discussed really in the talk, is uh, because Jews were involved in certain kinds of trade, right? Certain certain right certain shops were overwhelmingly right run by by Jewish merchants uh, you know I've heard um, you know I, people argue that certain certain types of businesses were seen as Jewish spaces by non-jews right not because there was anything Jewish about Jewish about a particular shop but because they presumed that a certain kind of shop that was displaying its wares in a certain way would be run by a Jewish merchant and so that these were seen as as Jewish, spaces, right, because they were seen as, you know, it was presumed that these were Jewish merchants running these places. I've also, I've also seen uh, the argument that in, let's say, the newer parts of, for example, Vilna, the neighborhood, the sort of newer parts of the city to the west, which was kind of middle class housing with newer, more modern flats, uh, that, that those were seen to some extent as Jewish neighborhoods of the city, 
because Jews were kind of overrepresented within a kind of middle class, a kind of intellectual, you know, not necessarily wealthy in the sense of merchants, but a kind of intellectual middle class, you know, better educated people in, in white collar jobs uh, were disproportionately Jewish and were living disproportionately in these more modern, more modern types of, of, of flats in these newer neighborhoods so that those were seen by by non-Jews in Vilna as, you know, as sort of Jewish buildings, although nothing explicitly about them, of course, would be marked as Jewish. So it's just this great example of the kind of arbitrary and historical and contingent way that things take on Jewishness, things take on a kind of palpable Jewishness, although they might not have a kind of essential Jewishness. Um, okay, there's lots more questions now. Um, okay, here's one. Would you think that Heschel's concept of Jews' attachment to time rather than space is a reaction to the loss of our domiciles and institutions. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll be mentioning Heschel's talk tomorrow in my Yiddish lecture, so you can cover, <laughs> have another uh, angle on that tomorrow. But um, yes, I mean, of course, there's there's a kind of stereotype that Jews are not concerned with art, let's say, you know, are not concerned with uh, with physical space because. Jews have moved around so much in the diaspora and Jewish culture is rooted around a text and not a, a holy object or a holy site, right? So the idea of Yiddish as a portable homeland, right? A kind of culture that's that's not linked to a particular locale, right? So I think, um, you know, you could argue that the whole idea of applying ideas about space to, to Jewish studies is a, is a way of pushing back against this idea that Jews you know, ha have not been concerned with space or with physical, you know, physical rootedness in place, right? And that, uh, or if they have, it's been the reaction against the diaspora experience, right? The Zionist goal of returning to a particular place and rooting Jews in their historic homeland, right? So I think that this, this approach, you know, that I have presented today is perhaps, you know, push, pushing back against that, that idea that the uh, that the uh, that Heschel right that Heschel's essay um, evokes. That makes sense. Uh, here's another question: Did the use of Yiddish signage continue in these Doicite type constructions that you're talking about, or is that something distinctive to that that first slide you showed us with the um, the sort of merchants with their Yiddish signs? Mm -hmm. I think it did continue uh, up until you know the Second World War. I think it it varied. By uh, by the kind of neighborhood that where uh, you know if you if you went to Jewish shops in not in the newer neighborhoods that I was focusing on but in the historic Jewish quarters which tended to be older and poorer uh, uh, and would also tend to be the center of traditional Jewish life so shops selling let's say religious objects uh, you would be more likely to see you know to see signs uh, in Yiddish. You know that would that would have been used either informally or formally. You know, up 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 through the 1930s. Hey, okay. here's another question. They're they're coming fast and furious. These questions um, were there distinctive characteristics to the Jewish constructions in less urban environments, for instance, camps or summer colonies. Uh, yeah, that's a great question. I, I mean, I, the first thing before you finish that sentence, for example, I was thinking of the shtetl because, of course, the shtetl is arguably the quintessential uh, Jewish, res, you know, Jewish space, let's say, of Eastern Europe, right? That many people tend to think of the shtetl as the quintessentially Jewish landscape, uh, and and there are many distinctive features of the shtetl, and that that's also some just the synagogue architecture has been more written about, I could have also said that the shtetl has been studied, uh, you know, uh, you know, Ala Sokolova, who you just mentioned, right, has done great and very meticulous work in a very specific way about shtetl architecture and shtetl space. So, so that would be another related topic, but specifically uh, summer colonies. And um, yeah, I, th I think that's a, it's a very interesting topic. There were, uh, uh, various kinds of Jewish building projects in rural areas uh, or on the, you know, the the far outskirts of cities, ranging from spas to uh, to kind of vacation colonies. Like uh, like there's a whole number of them in Otvosk on the outskirts of Warsaw. Uh, 
uh, to, um, to things like the Medem Sanatorium, uh, right? That, that were, again, that were situated in these rural areas because they were considered either vacation locations or healthful locations. And in some cases, they uh, copy the kind of local, uh, the, what's considered kind of Polish national style of the sort of wooden architecture, which is an interesting sort of counterexample of Jews sort of adopting something that was seen as a Polish national style. So I think there are many interesting examples that could be discussed there as well. Okay, um, here's one that's kind of uh, like metaphor based question. The Jewish political movements often used construction metaphors for the society that they were building. Was this expressed in the style these movements used in the buildings they built? <laughs> <laughs> well. Okay, I, yeah, I'm not, yeah, I, I, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I use the word building, right, in this kind of uh, uh, double, with this double meaning because it's absolutely true, right, that they often talked about um, building, right, building the future, building J Jewish youth, building the movement. And so I kind of picked up on that in uh, the way I use the term building to, to point to the literal construction of, of, of buildings, of structures, but, um, yeah, absolutely. I would say that you know, the way I framed the talk, I was trying to use this pun, but also to 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 link this kind of metaphoric effort to to strengthen and to plan for the future, with the fact that you know actually building these physical buildings represented quite an investment of resources that, after all, as I said, were, were immovable, right? If you were investing these large sums of money to build your school in Lublin, if you decided to emigrate to Palestine, you couldn't take it with you. So I think that. You know, the, the, these two ideas do do dovetail and kind of reinforce each other. That's so interesting. Okay, to take another New York example, how would you situate the purpose-built Yiddish art theater on Second Avenue from 1926 in the context of A, all the other theaters or the other theaters in the neighborhood and B, synagogue architecture and or Oh, B, synagogue architecture, or C, residential complexes in the Bronx that were established by Yiddish-oriented or organizations or heavily Jewish labor unions. Mm -hmm. So that was a lot, right? So mm -hmm. how, how do you situate the Yiddish art theater on 2nd Avenue compared to the other theaters, synagogues, or residential complexes in the Bronx with lefties and, mm -hmm. and Yiddish-oriented people? Mm -hmm. Well, the Yiddish Art Theater on Second Avenue is, is a very interesting example because it does have a very distinct architectural style picking up on this kind of Moorish slash Byzantine style that was often used for synagogues. And there's been a lot of a lot written, uh, including by John Efren, who might be on the call here, right, about the significance of the of this style in synagogue architecture as a kind of gesturing to Sephardic Jewish history and what that might imply. And there are some examples of, uh, of this style with its you know, kind of either Middle Eastern or Iberian connotations being used for secular Jewish buildings. For example, there's a marvelous building in, in Lvov, in, um, in Lviv, Lemberg, which, right, so, um, today in Ukraine. Uh, that um, that was built in this style, a Jewish hospital that was built in this style. So there are some very noticeable notable uses of this style in secular buildings, uh, and the the art theater would be one of those. So, but you know, the, so it's an interesting question why these Yiddish speaking you know theater um, professionals would choose that style, right? Which doesn't have a connotation of Eastern Europe, but it does it it does it did acquire a kind of distinctly Jewish connotation because it was prevalent in synagogue architecture from particular periods. So I haven't researched that building. It's a very interesting example, but I could perhaps speculate that that um, you know that that it was chosen because it was seen as a kind of Jewish style because of its use for synagogues. Yeah, that makes sense. It could it could be it, it could be secularized. It could be used for secular purposes like other things in synagogue style. Um, okay, Grada's novel describes the apartment that was rented in the cheap houses of Baroness Hirsch as a large room with a kitchen. Did some of the Billeke Heiser include a private kitchen? Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, 
Yeah, so the, uh, the original buildings in Warsaw, the first set of buildings, uh, some, of, some of them originally had private kitchens and then it was determined that this was too expensive. Those apartments were too expensive for the workers uh, to rent. So when the buildings were originally constructed in Vilna, they were, the, the apartments were only constructed uh, con that consisted of one room with shared kitchen and toilet and, and, and trash facilities. But from this description, I mean, we know that at some point in time, a lot of these apartments were modified. For example, one room apartments were put together to make larger apartments. We also know that at some point, uh, individual kitchens were added to the, to the apartments. And from Grada's description, we can see that this happened. Uh, we don't know exactly when it happened, but at, at least I haven't so far found documentation of exactly when it happened, presumably different apartments were converted at different times, but we can see that some apartments were converted by the 1930s, right, when he, from his, from his description. Okay, um, here's another one. People keep posting them. Um, okay. Thank you for the great talk. Who designed the courtyards and gardens, both uh -huh. in Europe and in the USA? How was the design of these influenced by the same interest in Yiddish education, health, and secular culture as the buildings you've mentioned? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's very interesting. I don't know who specifically who the landscape uh, architect was for, um, for the co-ops that I looked at. Uh, it's clear from the descriptions that there was a lot of emphasis placed on the landscaping. It's something that a lot of the writings uh, about these buildings kind of emphasizes. And you can see that if you, know, if you imagine residents moving from a tenement on the Lower East Side to these buildings, you can imagine that the green space was a big attraction for them, uh, and it does seem to it does you know seem to have been something that was that was uh, a lot of attention was devoted to. But uh, I don't I don't have the name of a specific uh, landscape architect that that uh, that worked on the design. Okay, hey. um, can you speak to the architecture of textile factories in Wuj that were erected by? Jewish magnates, I guess we should say Lodz, because this is a Yiddish space, um, or the Jewish cemetery in Lodz, which is so unique. Yeah, so Lodz is a really uh, fascinating example, also something I didn't, you know, cover today, but um, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the style of the, of the factories, I would say, is, you know, not distinctly Jewish. They're a kind of brick vernacular that was popular in industrial cities and in, you know in the late 19th century but one of the things that's striking about it uh, I would say is um, you know the kind of complex that that's that uh, that was constructed there where you have these large factories right uh, the like so you have this um, very elaborate palace <laughs> pretty much a very elaborate mansion by Poznansky uh, that's constructed right next to his factory so that he could, you know, cross the street or even just look out the window and keep an eye uh, on the doings there. And then across the street, uh, on the other side, workers' housing that was constructed also by Poznanski for the, the the labor force that worked in his factories. And then at the, um, uh, if you go to the main uh, to the to the Jewish cemetery in Lodge with this which, that the question referred to. Um, the main gate echoes the factory gate. So uh, one uh, commentary that I read sort of described this as, you know, this was Poznanski's way of saying that even when you die, I will still, you know, <laughs> you will still be part of my industrial empire, right? That this was a kind of empire that included the workspace, the living space, right? Uh, and then even the, you know, the cemetery, right? So it's, uh, you know, I think it's 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 interesting on this, this for the scale of of construction, right? That developed around right around this uh, industrial landscape. Yeah, and this really feeds into the next question, which was asked by you know a different person like ten minutes ago, um, but also is about Lods, where someone said, on the other end of the economic scale, have you looked at or compared to non-Jewish homes, the mansions constructed by wealthy Jewish industrialists? I'm remembering photographs of grand homes built in Lods. Yeah, I mean, there, there, there are certainly um, very impressive uh, homes that wealthy individuals built. I mean, most of, most of these people of great wealth were, uh, if anything, trying to show off their sense of belonging to the Polish 
or Russian, you know, upper class and not advertising, let's say, their Jewishness in the style of their buildings, right? I mean, or perhaps even just their, you know, their sort of pretensions to being European nobility, right? Um, you know, the Poznansky mansion, you could say, looks very French. It's certainly more French than, than Jewish, let's say. Uh, but there are, uh, you know, this, th this is also uh, an interesting topic uh, at uh, Oxford right now. There's a research project on Jewish country homes, on kind of large country estates that were built by wealthy British Jews. So there is some, some research being done on that, let's say that end of the uh, social and economic spectrum among Jewish residential architecture. All right. So I think we have three minutes left and there's two more questions here on my queue. So I'll give them to you both at the same time. One is very short. Were there mezuzot on the doors? And the other is much more complex, or I mean, probably the mezuzot question is also complex, but the other is a little longer, which is how might the Yiddish style in Poland differ from the Jewish buildings built in Germany or Austria? So we could take, take those in whatever order you want at whatever detail you want. Um, yeah, well, I, um... I would imagine that uh, you know that for the residential examples, at least in um, in Vilna that I've given, right, that in most cases uh, Jewish you know Jewish families were um, the overwhelming majority of residents were Jews. There were some Christian families in the in the chief houses that I described that they would have mezuzahs on their you know on their door. Um, uh, it's been suggested to me that I could look for traces of mezuzahs as a way to kind of see the predominance of Jewish residents versus non-Jewish residents. But of course, today it's, uh, you know, there's been so much res renovation, it's hard to, uh, you know, to, um, to use that as a gauge. Although there are many cases where uh, homes in Poland that were formerly inhabited by Jews still have traces of the mezuzahs that have been used as to create artworks and things like that to kind of commemorate former Jewish residents in a very resonant way. Uh, as for the second question, uh, uh, you know, I would say that, um, I mean, the examples that come to mind uh, that I alluded to in my talk uh, in Western Europe uh, were uh, examples where groups or individuals from various left, left, left wing political movements undertook projects like housing co-ops, where they often used architectural styles that were you know, very cutting edge, like socialist, uh, you know, housing co-ops in, in Vienna that were, uh, in, you know, in in um, the Bauhaus style or in Amsterdam in expression in the expressionist style. So um, these weren't particularly Jewish, uh, you know, Jewish buildings, I should say, or you know. So um, yeah, I'm not I'm not sure if that's uh, really addressing the last the last question there. Um, but also, you know, the Yiddish-speaking Yiddish communities in those cities were certainly significant in various points in time, but also largely transient, right? If we think of Paris or Berlin, uh, Yiddish-speaking communities by the 20s, by the late 19th or 20th century, right? These were usually immigrant communities themselves, and often, uh, you know, not uh, not of long duration. So, so perhaps their actual construction activities were were more limited. Yeah. Wow. Well, this is wonderful. So, uh, so there's there's two things I wanted, three things I guess that I that I should do. Uh, one is to say, Cecile, you have to read the chat. The people here are so knowledgeable, and as you were talking, people were making suggestions and offering resources, sources, opinions, more examples of things. So go and look at all of it and, you know, screenshot it. Um, and the other thing, the next thing I wanted to say is everybody who's here, come tomorrow and hear Cecile give another talk off Yiddish. So, you know, noch besser, but this was wonderful. So I don't know, could it be better, but it will be wonderful tomorrow also. So come at noon tomorrow. Um, and let's see, Shana, are you posting the, um, the the link to for yes okay look there's the registration link for tomorrow so please everybody go and register and um and with that i think we bring this to a close so thank you thank you cecile thank you gabriella for uh, for all your your wonderful moderating and to to uh, charlotte and shana and everyone at jewish studies at stanford as well as to everyone who uh who attended the uh 
who attended the talk. I know looking at Zoom for hours, it can be quite uh, <laughs> quite draining. So uh, I, I'm, I'm delighted that so many people chose to tune in.